Good afternoon and welcome to the Emerging Tech series of the Leadership and Insurance podcast. I'm your host, Gavin Savage, and this is the podcast where we speak to technology founders, executives and leaders from the world of InsureTech. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Talha, Director of Product at The Guarantors. Talha, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you, Gavin. Uh, excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, excited to have you on. We've been talking for many months on and off, uh, so it's good to get this one booked in. And um, you were asking how my summer was. I think it's always a seems to be a running theme in my podcast that we speak about the weather. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it uh, reminds me of Scotland, actually. I'm just based outside of London. It's grey, balmy and a bit bland, to be honest. And that's been a bit of the story of our summer. But how's... Um, How's New York? I mean, remember the last time we spoke, it was a bit apocalyptic would be the word to use. Apocalyptic would be the word. That was around the conference, right? The InsurTech conference. Yeah. Um, I think we've gotten over the apocalyptic phase and it's bright and sunny today outside my window. So I think we're uh, we're maybe healing, which is good. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, what was it? Kind of like just the air was just effectively was polluted it was uh it looked it looked like something out of a horror film absolutely it was crazy yeah um it was uh unfortunately the the, the wildfires uh out of canada um and actually right. being myself uh in the u.s uh i i often heard uh, heard that <laughs> <laughs> that flame go around but uh uh I, I i do think it's great that we've somewhat uh brought that under control now <clears throat> yeah yeah absolutely it's um well look i think before we uh before we dive right in again always a nice theme to start with would you mind just giving us a little introduction about yourself how you got into you know generally your role as a product and um, person and um i guess how you've now ended up in the world of insure tech yeah no for sure um i would say my 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 foray into product uh really came from the angle of uh, business and, and and generally thinking about uh, sort of new products in general, uh, particularly in the financial services space. Uh, and so um, I got my start in financial services uh, really out of college uh, and in university. Uh, originally, it started from just this interest of, uh, you know, the fact that um, uh, money is such a core part of uh, everyone's life and personal finances as well. And so uh, it, it felt like a good area to try and make an impact in. And so all my you know internships uh, <laughs> during college were are all in that in that domain. Um, and as soon as I graduated, um, I graduated into um, a job in consulting, which is sort of a traditional uh, management consulting firm uh, working on um, everything from payments to uh, to to uh, problems in at, at banks and asset managers and others. Uh, and and that you know really cemented my uh, interest in this at least industry. Uh, vertical, which was which was financial services, and at the time it was really from a from a business angle. Um, but but how that translated into thinking about product and product management in, in particular was uh, just the fact that I got interested in all the new things that were happening in the space and uh, the the types of new products and digitization that a lot of these, particularly incumbents, were starting to take on. Um, I, I left my first gig, uh, my first gig out, out out of consulting. I left to go join. Uh, Capital One, uh, which which there um, I was leading a product team in in its uh, uh, innovation lab, innovation factory, if you want to call it that. Um, and and really, what the bank was trying to do was say, hey, we've got all of these things that we're doing in our first and second horizon with our traditional products. Um, what else can we do with all of the resources that we have uh, at our at our disposal? And I think that's that's sort of the point at which uh, it clicked with me. That if I wanted to sort of string this thread together of uh, of of thinking about this industry, but also trying to innovate on uh, what's the next set of things that we can all build, uh, it had to be from this angle of product, trying to combine uh, you know business uh, strategic thinking of what's happening from a business standpoint, uh, what can we develop from an engineering standpoint, folding and design, uh, and really then packaging that all together to figure out how do you move. Uh, a particular business product uh, or, or other thing forward. Um, and, and so, you know, that journey at Capital One was great. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the 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 transition into insurance and insure tech in particular uh, came from uh, just observing the overall landscape in financial services. I felt um, while banking uh, payments, other verticals, uh, I thought were progressing nicely. Um, 
I continuously felt insurance is maybe like uh, 10, 20 years behind. Uh, and, and, and that just, that just, I think provided good fodder, uh, for, for, uh, a bigger, uh, uh, bigger stakes and, uh, in, in, in larger product bets and larger innovation, uh, translated that first into, um, uh, in, into a, a job at MetLife, uh, which obviously is a, is a super large incumbent, uh, across, uh, I think we were in 40 plus countries, um, and, and, uh, and, and lots of billions of dollars of revenue, uh, but in many ways, um, there was still a lot to be done from a from a product standpoint, uh, and so that's the charge I led. Um, and and I would say at that point, I fully cemented both this sort of concept of from a career standpoint, uh, sticking with the product role and trying to bring that all together, plus just the uh, opportunity and in insurance to 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 make a difference. Mm. Interesting, awesome, thank you. And and then coming from MetLife into now the guarantors probably makes sense. I'm sure a lot of people know who who the guarantors are, but do you want to just explain a little bit about who the guarantors are and what the business is about? Yeah, totally. Uh, and so I made that transition uh, about a year ago now, um, and so uh, it's been a it's been a big transition. Um, MetLife, uh, I think, clocked in at uh, sixty thousand uh, plus employees or something along those lines. Uh, mm-hmm. The guarantors, uh, we are a humble 200, uh, but doing a lot, uh, and 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 that's a, that's been an exciting transition. But to your question of uh, what is the guarantors, uh, the way that I like to describe it is um, we operate at two different intersections. Uh, the first intersection is uh, of real estate uh, and and financial services, um, really insurance, uh, and then the other intersection is um, uh, property uh, uh, property managers and operators being one side of the equation in terms of customers uh, and their residents and renters being on the other side. Uh, and so at those two intersections, um, the reason the company was founded and what we believe is there are a number of different needs, uh, primarily financial needs uh, that uh, historically or previously were unmet. Uh, as an example, um, in our bread and, br- uh, bread and butter uh, uh, product um, is, is around the fact that, uh, you know, on one side, property operators in real estate, um, have their largest uh, risk, one of their larger risks is the risk of, of default, right? So someone, let's say not paying rent. Uh, on the other side, uh, what that means uh, for renters and residents is that um, oftentimes operators or property managers are not able to accept uh, everyone, right? And so you can't mm-hmm. access your dream home. Uh, imagine the person who uh, just moved to the US as I actually did from, from Canada to the US and uh, you don't sort of have a credit record or credit file, um, you can you can be in a position where that's, uh, uh, you know, some of these places you want to access are not accessible to you. Uh, and so we step in there um, to, to convert that into an insurance problem or, or a financial problem. Uh, and so uh, that, that's been our bread and butter, but really that's the foundation um, off which uh, we've been able to grow into just at these two uh, cross sections real estate, financial services, property operators, and their residents uh, have have found a number of different opportunities where uh, there are needs from both of those parties, both of those industries uh, that we're uh, continuing to serve. Mm. And and just kind of going back from your experience coming from, it's a question I get asked a lot, you know, when I'm uh, obviously, you know, I do executive search and, um, yeah, candidates or people that are interested in moving from, say, MetLife or Aon or Axe or whatever, you know, the big incumbents that move to a startup or an insure tech specifically moving to an insure tech, they always ask me, you know, what is the, what is it that you'd have to, do you have any tips about what they're looking for, like, or, or how you adapt from working in? I mean, how's that journey been going from incumbent to scaling startups since I know you joined a year ago, but they're still on that big growth journey. Like what's it been like for you and, and any tips for anyone that's looking to make that transition? Yeah. Um, the, the, the journey has been great. I mean, look, the, the reason I made the transition was, uh, uh, very much for personal growth. Uh, the, the, um, the extent of uh, ownership you get at a, at a, at a relatively smaller, uh, company or earlier stage one and the intensity of problems, uh, that you have to solve, uh, plus the stakes at which you're solving them at, um, is just incredible, right? And so it's it's a great, uh, it's very fertile ground for you to learn a lot uh, very fast. And as you said, it's been a year, but uh, uh, it feels like uh, it feels like I've learned uh, five, ten years worth. Uh, and so anyone considering the transition, I, I do 
I do think it's a it's a good one at some point in your career uh, to 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 consider and and try out at least. Um, uh, I will say, I mean, I think the the the, the tips angle, are like what what are some things that work? Um, first and foremost, I'd say actually for anyone looking to make the transition, I think there's sometimes this uh, this sort of notion that uh, that that if you've been at an incumbent, you actually may struggle with uh, uh, with being at an earlier stage company, and I actually think that's that's missing the mark. Uh, in fact, um, I actually have a lot of appreciation for my experience uh, at being a large company. Right there, there's something uh, uh, truly impressive and magical about a company uh, as large as, as in my example, MetLife, uh, that that's been around for 100 plus years, makes billions of dollars, and does that year in, year out. Uh, it's only something uh, any company can aspire to do, right? And so, uh, tip number one is uh, own that. Right and and really understand that you bring something to the table. You kind of have seen the the end picture, uh, and and for all of these um, a lot of these earlier stage uh, companies, it's about how do we go from here to to being that type of incumbent. And so you kind of seen that picture. Uh, it's end journey at least. That'd be one thing. Beyond that, I think it's uh, really about um, you know it comes down to resources. That's the major difference between the two um, angles. And so uh, first, it's uh, you know, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Yeah. Uh, you won't have the resources to uh, to actually set all the processes that you want. Uh, you're, you're, you're almost like uh, building the plane while you're flying it. And so you just have to be comfortable doing that and lean into it and understand that if you said one thing Monday, by Friday, you may actually decide it's a complete different way and that's okay. You, you just have to sort of keep going and leaning into that and, uh, and, and figuring out at any given point What's the uh, what's the best thing to do, um, and and really that also speaks to the fact that at any larger company the planning cycles and what you're doing is on a longer time horizon and you're just shortening that uh, when you go smaller. Um, so 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 that would be perhaps the second thing, and then the final thing I'd say is um, in terms of tips, um, it, it's really um, you you got to learn to be scrappy, right? Uh, back to the resource point, um, you you don't you won't have hundreds of people to throw out a problem. You have maybe one. And so yeah. what that means is uh, the, the the need to solve that problem is still the same, but um, how you do it and the approach you take will have to be different, right? Uh, you have to sort of figure out um, what's that one lever that moves the needle 10x versus finding the 10th lever that only moves it 1x, which could be uh, an opportunity for you when you have more resources. Uh, but but it's certainly not the case when when uh, when that's not that's not the case. Uh, and so um, being scrappy is uh, is, is another one. Yeah, I mean it's it's a great it's a great insight. I think for me, um, what all of that boils down to, what you've just said, is just it's more down to the person. There's no real way you can give someone an answer. You can prepare them for what's ahead within a startup, but you can't. It's got it's got to be down to the mindset. You know, it's is that person that type of person to transition to all of the things that hasn't really been prevalent in a large incumbent? You've got the resources. You don't really need to be scrappy. Those processes in place. You're not building the plane as as you're flying, yeah. as you kind of suggested. So, as I say, I think a lot of people say that to me. You know, I don't want to see you know I recruit for startups seeds to Series C. So, a lot of that want is from people from similar environments but i do think we overlook a lot of people from the incumbent space yeah yeah no absolutely and i think there's there's something to it right um i think there's um it's actually healthy uh, it, it's healthier for the broader ecosystem if there's more of an interchange i think because mm. uh, that that i think uh, uh makes everything uh work better um right and so uh, i think incumbents often have a lot of uh, interesting things to bring to the table uh whether it be from a deep uh industry expertise and knowledge Right, like we, we, for example, ourselves rely on our carriers um, a lot, and and they're 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 entrenched in a lot of knowledge that we utilize, and so exchange yeah. of talent there even almost can embed that within your company. Uh, similarly, back out to incumbents uh, from earlier stage companies, I think that's generally healthier for the ecosystem. Mm. And kind of going back to the guarantors, I'm always interested, particularly speaking with you know product leaders like yourself. How do you define the guarantors? You know, it's a B to B to C business, it helps insure operators across PNC line. You know, we were talking off camera about how the investment world's changed and focusing on more risk bearing entities, MGAs, MGUs. You know, how do you, where do you put pigeonhole them 
the guarantors? Are they are they are they providing an insurance product or are they are they a kind of company that's operating in tech company operating in insurance space? Like how, how do you kind of Yeah, so we do actually a variety of different uh models, but but at its most core, it's just what you described. It's 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 uh we we, we are in uh, MGA and uh and so we work um uh with underlying carriers to provide our products. In some cases, we're starting to um, also do that ourselves. And so over the over the years, uh, you know, uh, seven plus years now, um, the company's been around. I think we have a, a better understanding of both our underwriting and risk practices, um, uh, and that's refined over time. And so in certain cases now, we're actually able to take that on ourselves and write it to our own book, uh, which is a which is a which has been a new sort of thing for us as a company, uh, and then really varies. Um, uh, per product line, right? And as we're thinking about new product lines, the, the mix can almost change in terms of uh, what particular model we're trying to uh, to to adopt. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's just that of understanding um, the underlying product we're trying to uh, ensure uh, working either with our carrier partners or our own sort of uh, model uh, to be able to uh, uh, underwrite that risk and, and sort of provide that service. Uh, in the way that it needs to be provided um, uh, to those to those end, end customers. Yeah, and I guess that explains perfectly why since 2016 you've raised over 100 million as a business. You know, some huge raises in the past um, 12 to 18 months when the market's been very turbulent. But given your positioning as to what you offer, being that entity, it's. Um, do you think that's one of the main reasons why you guys have pushed through, or is it because it's a very competitive market? Yeah. You guys are in there's some large big players which appreciate you won't be competing against, but you know, it's a very crowded market. What do you think that is that I know you're not a VC, but what do you think people are looking to now invest in and why do you think the guarantors has been so successful over the last few years since its inception? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question and, and one that uh everyone's uh thinking about these days, right? Uh just given the the funding climate. Um it's funny. I, I think in many ways we were we were built for this environment, uh, and that's actually a, a testament to our full team and our founders in particular. Um, and and I think it it goes to um, two major things, right? Uh, firstly, it's a it's a it's a testament to uh, to just our customer need that we're solving, true pain point, true need, validated year over year over year, and we've just been expanding off the base that I described earlier. Uh, and so that that's that's proven in uh, you know the number of customers we're signing up, the retention rates that we have, uh, the 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 ability to continually service them at, at high degrees of satisfaction levels, uh, and and just the growth that we've seen, right? And and so there's no there's no funding if the business itself isn't working, um, and 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 there isn't actually a need you're 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 solving. And so uh, the first and foremost uh, thing is just that. Uh, the flip side of it, um, and 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 perhaps not the flip side, but the other side of it is um, uh, is the the climate, as you know, uh, has shifted right, uh, both from a, a venture standpoint and generally for insurance. Also, I, I think uh, perhaps falsely so, uh, insurance in particular and insure tech uh, was was chasing growth uh, over perhaps uh, more sensible uh, business models, and, and I think um, where we've where we've um, Taking the opposite side of that bet, and frankly, full credit to our to, to our to our founding team, has been a very sensible, disciplined growth um, every step of the way. Right at the end of the day, uh, insurance in particular is a business where you're supposed to be there uh, at the time of need, right? And so what that what that means is uh, you have to grow the business in a way that you will be there if there are issues, right? And so we take that. That mission and that mandate from our customers very seriously. Uh, it, it it comes into the ethos of how we think about growth, how we think about um, product building, how we think about uh, getting into new areas, uh, and 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 so um, with that discipline and the fact that that's uh, translated into something where where we're as a business financially sustainable and uh, and 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 it's successful, uh, you know that I think uh, uh, alongside the customer. Uh, customer need and pain point translates into recognition from external uh, market um, investors and others and and the funding rounds um, you've seen. Mm. Yeah, super interesting. And yeah, I mean, for you guys, 2016 um, was when all the journey can all began. I know you've only been there for, you know, just a year so far, but as you say, it feels like a lot longer. 
I mean, the evolution of the products I was really interested in, you know, the first product being the launch's lease guarantee, and then the second product, the third product, all across a kind of six, seven year span. And it's one thing that we've been talking about a lot recently on the podcast with even CTOs, of course, you know, the that constant need to feel like you have to add new products or add new features. Like, yeah. how do you, as a product leader, when you come in, how do you know when it's time to add or when it when it's not time? Like, is it always is it always a risk to to think about adding a new product or do do you just know when it's right? Yeah. Um, firstly, I really like the uh, fact that you asked it as um, at the last bit. There is it always a risk because. I think just to connect it back to the previous uh, uh, question or statement, um, yeah. it, it can be, right? Because uh, new, new products inherently uh, mean um, deployment of capital, deployment of resources, uh, and deployment of uh, just general attention of the company, right? And so if you if you marry that with the fact that uh, we're an insurance company, uh, we are supposed to be there at when, at when, when uh, something goes wrong, um, if you if you sort of go too deep into uh, taking wild product bets uh, that are that are perhaps risky or uh, distract you or uh, dedicate too much capital or resources that that actually uh, works against your your core mission at times, right? And so um, there's this bit in that about uh, being very deliberate around bets and de-risking them as we go mm-hmm. along the way to be able to um, be fairly certain when we launch something that we will be there to uh, facilitate it and uh, we're going to stand behind it for a long period of time. Right. And so uh, yeah. for us, like, as we think about, um, you know, um, how to launch uh, products or, or when to launch, when we feel it, that it's right, that that's sort of the equation that we're going off of. And, and so um, it's this overall concept of de-risking before, before launch uh, and, and uh, you know, how do you, how do you de-risk? Uh, I think uh, de-risking first, is about actually ensuring that you're solving the core customer problem and a customer need. Um, that's done through um, tireless uh, sort of uh, uh, conversations with uh, and and working with our direct customers um, um, uh, in a variety of ways. Right, that's sort of the first way you de-risk. Uh, alternatively, you're you're sort of completely at the at the gate, not solving something that's actually a need. Um, beyond that, um, I think it's de-risking. By being very honest and transparent with ourselves about what are we actually good at, at what's what's the game we're playing, and what's the game someone else is playing, and any particular new product or feature idea or something that we as a company are considering, uh, let's just sort of uh, look at each other between different functions, including product design engineering, uh, and think about whether it falls in our core strengths, right? And for us, it's working with operators, working with renters at that cross section, um, being, being strong around underwriting and our and our sales practices. Uh, and, and it needs to sort of fit that um, fit, the, fit that mold. Uh, and then finally, I think it's de-risking eventually, if it sort of clears those two gates, uh, it's about de-risking it from the basis of, uh, you know, will this actually be a viable business? Can we, yeah. do we, do we see something here that allows us to create something sustainable? Because Alternatively, then again, we're 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 putting at risk um, our sort of mandate uh, to to from our customers of uh, with our core business being uh, being there when they need us um, and and you know thankfully the way that we've been able to build so far that's proven out each time uh, each sort of new successive that has has worked out and uh, knock on wood that the next few do as well. Uh, we've launched some interesting new things recently, and uh, uh, and so so you know we're we're keeping building, but we're de-risking along the way. Mm. Interesting. And as a as a leader in both product and tech, you know, again, I'm always interested about that perspective and how you navigate through constant change within a startup and a scale up. Again, you would have had that experience, that incubation period, and in your incumbent previous life and more so now at, at um at the guarantors but that that navigation through constant change coupled with balancing the needs versus now and in the future again from a product perspective i just want wanted to get your your opinion and, and how you how you manage that yeah and so you're thinking um you know what's um what lets us uh, uh ensure that we're building for the now immediate needs yeah. how do we sort of keep an eye on uh, yeah the future right 
Exactly. Yeah. I, um, I, look, there's no one size fits all approach in that, but I think um, uh, at the end of the day, um, it, it's it's really sort of about um, how we set up our teams to go after um, these types of things. And so uh, uh, it, it comes from us understanding our business in a way that allows us to form particularly product design engineering teams um, and sort of their trio pods, if you will, uh, in a way that they um, actually are, are tied to a particular uh, business value stream or customer journey, if you will, right? And so if you take the insurance, the classic insurance flow of, uh, there's some sort of um, discovery application process to then you're, you're quoting some product and and then you're sort of you know paying for it and onwards. Uh, the way that we like to think about it, at least, is uh, that's a uh, that that's sort of a journey that that we can then tie particular product design engineering teams to, uh, and if they understand uh, and and they're operating sort of in one of those slivers, if they understand that um, value stream and that customer need very well, they themselves can think about balancing on an ongoing basis. Hey, what do I need to do today to make sure the lights keep on? Versus like, what is it that if I, you know, when I, when I sort of look out to a year or two, what are other things that I, that I need to invest in? And, and the reality is um, that uh, particularly as a, as a leader, um, you're never going to have that full ground reality. And so for me, I really just think about it from the basis of like, how do we set up our teams to be able to answer that question? Uh, and then uh, for ourselves, um, uh, for, for myself, for, uh, for my peers, uh, it, it's all about, um, uh, you know, thinking about um, uh, ensuring we give the the runway to the teams to be able to manage the now and uh, the future planning and the future thinking. We're constantly sort of reconciling between all of our our, our teams as well as our uh, external sort of customer uh, touch points to try and figure out where the market is headed. Right, where where's the where's the puck going that we can then start to to, to follow it. And then when you're when you're setting the teams up, like you know, it's I appreciate there's quite a few leaders within the guarantors, but just in your experience over your career, like we see this evolution of design, engineering and product, that trio that you talk about, um, being very closely interlinked almost as one team. Yeah. I appreciate they have their own their own leaders, but you talk about setting that team up. Like how do you do that? How do you measure the success of your team as you're yeah. focused on something that is to be it's decided we're doing this, we're going for it, like Every team from especially design, especially engineer, I mean, they're both as nuanced as each other, but then coupled with product, like how do you kind of differentiate those key markers between product, engineer, and design again? Because everyone does respond very differently. It's a tough job. Yeah, uh, no, totally. <laughs> uh, and it's actually a very interesting question um, and one I think about a lot. Uh, and in many ways, I actually think the, uh, the, the, the way to do this is almost the flip of trying to almost like cater to each of product and design and engineering as separate uh, things. Uh, to me, the teams that have worked out the best uh, and, and ones that we try and form uh, at, at, our, at, at my current company as well is uh, at TG is, um, is to ensure that every pod and every team actually very clearly understands the particular business and product outcome. And by product outcome, I don't mean the product function outcome. I mean, like truly, the, the customer need product problem that we're trying to solve for, right? If 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 we're very deliberate and and almost like single threaded on, hey, what is that one thing that we're trying to solve for, uh, let's say in the next quarter, and and here's the way that we're going to measure it, and here's the way we're going to understand it, and it's a joint job of product design and engineering together to solve that. Like at the end of the day, you're going to be measured on that on that outcome and how you can sort of um, help create innovative new ways to solve uh, that that sort of one one problem um, and, and all your sort of respective functional uh, expertise uh, is going to that that, that ultimate uh, resolution, right? Um, and, and so, you know, in setting up those teams and that's where I spend a lot of time is to, uh, is to enable uh, each of those pods and each of those teams to kind of really clearly understand hey, um, this is what we believe really matters at the moment. This is what we're trying to do. And, you know, everyone brings something to that table in that in that trio. Uh, and, and you're going to sort of rely on your functional expertise to be able to pitch in. But ultimately, the sort of whole team is accountable for this one thing versus, mm -hmm. 
product being responsible for one thing, design another, engineering another, and other functions, something else. Yeah. I mean, it's it's more, and maybe I'm a bit naive or, or you know, I don't know, but it's more fascinating to me that every company does not work like that. Maybe they do now. Maybe the pennies dropped, but I think that bias towards action, you know, I think is something is hopefully a thing of the past where engineers seeing a product leader come into the business, maybe there's no CTO in the business, you know, and they see this person that's going to come in and dictate exactly what you said at the latter yeah. part there, you know, we're going to own this, you're going to own that, you yeah. know, stay out of our way and then we're going yeah. to give you we're going to give you absolutely specific requirements and you must yeah. stick to them, you know, taking ownership of the product life cycle. Like I yeah. think your, your approach clearly is about being your, your approach is clearly batting for both sides and being fair to both product and engineering and bringing it all in house is the one. Yeah. And I think um, I, I actually it's, it's funny. The, there's been a, there's been sort of a gradual evolution of each of these functions in each of these roles. Right. Mm-hmm. If you if you think about um, and it's, and I really saw this actually at MetLife um, and a lot of these incumbents you you saw like the the way that product was done maybe in some pockets you saw it the way it was done in, in the nineties and in some way you saw it uh, it was done in the two thousands and then in some parts of the organization you saw it sort of gradually evolve to be more modern and I, I sort of saw all phases of that uh, including for engineering and design also and I think the the where uh, in some cases. Uh, the 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 ball is moving to the right direction is that um, historically I think both design and engineering sometimes uh, were uh, shielded from the the sort of business context or the 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 objective we're trying to reach and it almost was this thing where uh, product is a translator right um, uh, and 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 that's where you get these notions and this concept of Hey, like the product person is going to talk out to the customer and and the other functions, and then they're going to take everything that they have and put it into these like very large, very specific requirement documents, and and then they're going to sort of ship it off and and then uh, throw it over the fence, and some people are going to work on it. And I think that's that's actually missing the mark on where uh, we are uh, uh, with all these functions today, uh, yeah. uh, which is that. I think engineers and designers very well understand business context as well, right? Like everyone uses uh, the, the, the apps that we use and everyone understands how business in general works. And, and I'm sure like the, the the degree of understanding may vary a little bit, uh, but but nonetheless, like it's, it's, it's perhaps not what it used to be. Um, and so I think um, when you have that, that sort of context in mind, uh, you can almost uh, empower everyone to to work together way better, right? And and um, I really push all of our teams to uh, understand that uh, the job for product in particular isn't to feed engineers or designers. Uh, they own the product as well. So back to the idea of the pod and the trio are owning that sort of business business outcome. Uh, or that or that product outcome, uh, you're sort of jointly making decisions, uh, and and product's role in all that is um, just to be, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, an amplifier, a connector, um, uh, almost like setting the pace and setting the tone, um, and and ensuring that there's a good connection between each uh, each tree and each function, and almost like sort of filling the gaps uh, where where there are uh, where there are challenges. Mm. You said something. You said a lot of interesting things there, but you said something really interesting to me in the sense of, you know, way back to the 90s, we've seen that shift in culture, you know, the ball's headed in the right direction. Like, you know, you've you've been on both sides of the fence, you know, as we've kind of said a couple of times already, incumbent startup incubation within an incumbent, which gives that kind of startup feel like, what do you think over the years and companies, like, is the biggest difference that we're, we're starting to see from your perspective in terms of culture and and been able to, I wouldn't say affect it, but how is it? How is it? How has it been for you to try and affect that? Has it got gotten easier than it was years ago? Like, what's your kind of take on that? Is, is how have we evolved? Yeah, and I think it's um it it varies by uh, type of company and type of um uh, where you are in your stage, but generally, I do think uh, 
it look it, it goes it speaks probably to our general environment and general culture i think there's a lot of uh, what i love to see these days is the all the the connectedness that we have uh, in any particular industry or in any particular um, uh, sort of domain and so there's a lot of general sort of information sharing and understanding and learning, whether it be podcasts like this or our conferences that we were talking about earlier um, or other things. And so I think um, what that's allowed to do is uh, in terms of um, culture setting, right? And that's, I think you were really just getting to that, um, is that uh, everyone is coming to the table uh, with uh, some of their own understanding already sort of built in. And this ability to themselves inherently learn more of how they're going to self-improve, right? And and bring more to the table, um, uh, 10x one month, 10x the next month, and on and on and on. And that to me makes things easier, right? Um, mm -hmm. It makes things easier in the sense easier in the sense that back to the concept of different uh, teams and functions coming together to build a product. Um, it, it means that uh, you know engineering is thinking about um, how to improve engineering and they're connected into that domain and they're learning more continuously with all of these resources um similarly with product similarly with uh with design and so um it allows for a better base foundational level to, for you to work off of uh, continuously right and in many ways as a as a leader it's it's funny you're 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 having to kind of stay even uh, even you're you're having to be faster <laughs> than than uh, sort of your team's learning almost so you're sort of keeping up with them all um, which is uh, which is a great challenge uh, but I think that in many ways has made it uh, has has made it easier. And then because we see well, some one thing I see a lot on the rise is that rise of the, the product engineer, you know, someone looking to hire in and rather than maybe hiring two things they'll just hire one. Yeah, um, and I think for what you've described there, it just allows. It creates just ease. It must have created over the years far easier buy-in from engineering than what it used to be. Kind of going back to that point, oh, here comes the product leader, new into the company, unsure of how it's going to work. Like, yeah, over the last few years, it must be a lot easier to get that buy-in from from engineering to to kind of get them what what needs to be done. Yeah, and and look, I think uh, that that's where it, it's really very contextual driven of what your need is as a as a company, as a as a particular leader, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, we see these shifts in so many different functions, right? Um, yeah. In, recently, uh, I think it was last month, uh, there was this uh, interesting example of Airbnb doing on the product side. Uh, they're sort of now product marketing managers, right? So they're combining that role. It always existed, but they're they're even going further in. Uh, similarly, product engineering, right? Um, are, are some uh, companies are still doing the full sort of trio model. And I think it's a, it's just a fact of um, that um, everyone's leveling up the right way. And, uh, and what does that, what does that then mean for, um, uh, for your given context and your given situation? For example, you know, if you're a, if you're a, uh, if you're a newly minted seed company and you've got sort of three, four, five people at a, at a, at a table, everyone's wearing that hat right and 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 uh and so the the and if you grow from there if it's product engineering or product design first like that's that's the way to play that context and the way to sort of manage that company at that point and and that may grow or change as you grow as a company um but but uh there's certainly i think something to be said of the fact that all of these different types of roles i do think start to blend together um and so the the real uh uh, the real thing you can you can do is understand your context and your uh you know what game you're playing at the moment uh to ensure your setup is is fitting that uh fitting that need yeah fantastic well look i'm just kind of conscious of your time i uh it's been a product and cultural insight for sure um thank you very much for coming on talha and um yeah look enjoy enjoy the rest of your day yeah appreciate it